If you've ever run out of ethernet ports on your router, or you have several different ethernet devices you need to hardwire in a room that only has one ethernet port on the wall, then you probably had to go out and buy an ethernet switch. And you probably realize there's tons of different options for these that come in every shape, size, color, and of course price tag. And it's easy to imagine why a switch, for example, with 24 ports might cost more than a switch with five ports. But there are other situations where a switch might look exactly the same as another one, but cost several times more. So what's the deal with that? For example, here's a 48 port switch from Netgear. It's gigabit and it costs around $250. Whereas this is the one I actually have in my home. It's from Unify, different brand, but it also has 48 ports. And this one costs around $800, but that's not even the most expensive model because there's one that costs over $1,000, even though it looks exactly the same as the one that I have. Clearly there's a lot more going on than meets the eye. And these expensive switches do in fact have most of the time a lot more features than the cheaper ones. But for most average people, these features are gonna be completely irrelevant, but to some, they are worth the extra price. So let's go over what are some of the most common reasons why a switch might be more expensive, a lot more expensive than another one. The first criteria is whether or not the switch is managed or unmanaged. Now, an unmanaged switch is basically just a dumb switch where you plug everything in, everything's automatic, it just routes traffic, you don't have to configure it or you can't configure it even if you wanted to at all. You plug something in, immediately the entire rest of the network can see it. It's pretty simple and straightforward. And for 99.9% .9 of people, an unmanaged switch like this is all you will ever need. But there's another type of switch called a managed switch that gives you a lot of control over the traffic and the devices connected to it in a way that you simply can't get with an unmanaged switch. For example, you can set up things like VLANs or virtual LANs that will separate and isolate certain devices into virtual networks so they can't be seen by other VLANs. This might be useful if you have different, I don't know, IoT devices, Internet of Things devices, which are known to be not very secure. Maybe you wanna put them all on their own little virtual network so they can still connect to the net internet and stuff like that, but they can't access the rest of your network if they get compromised or something. You can configure it that way if you wanted to with a managed switch. You might also have the ability to do quality of service control so you can control which devices can have how much bandwidth, that sort of thing. You can also see the statistics of different devices on that switch. A lot of these might also be available in a router, but you can get it with the switch itself too. And then typically, if you're using a managed switch, these will have some sort of web interface to configure it with, similar like you would get with a router. You simply type in the IP address of the switch and it'll get into that settings menu and then you can control it however you want through there. And again, for a vast majority of people, these settings, you might not even know what they do. They're not gonna be useful to you at all. And they are very advanced. So even if you wanted to do something Thing, it'd probably take quite a bit of research to figure it out. Now, one thing I will point out is if you do go and buy a managed switch, it's not like you have to configure it. Usually these are just gonna work out of the box like an unmanaged switch, but if you wanna do all the extra stuff, you can go in there and do it if you want. But it's not like if you accidentally buy a managed switch, then you're not gonna be able to use it. It'll work the same and you probably wouldn't even realize there's a difference unless you go in and try to change everything. All right, next up, the next reason why a switch might be significantly more expensive than another one is the port speeds on there. Now, these days, pretty much every single switch is gonna at least have gigabit ports on there. Even the really affordable ones with lots of ports, they're probably gonna all be gigabit, but there are some that have 10 gigabit. But for the most part, instead of seeing a switch that is all 10 gigabit, Usually you're gonna see one that has a lot of one gigabit ports and then a few 10 gigabit extra ports on there. For example, on my switch, it's 48 one gigabit RJ45 connections, regular ethernet ports, and then there are four additional SFP type ports on there, two of which are regular SFP one gigabit, and then there's two SFP plus 10 gigabit ports on there. Now, when there's this kind of configuration where there's a couple ports that are way faster than the other ones, that's usually called an uplink. And the reason for that is if you have maybe one or two devices on your network that are capable of supporting way faster speeds, and then you want all the other devices which are a little bit slower that want to be able to connect to that really fast device all at once. And in a case of, for example, like a NAS server where there's lots of files, maybe it has a 10 gigabit uplink to the switch, then each individual device might only pull a maximum of one gigabit from it, 
but this way, if you have a 10 gigabit uplink to the switch, you can have maybe 10 devices all at once connecting at 10 gigabit, so you can still use that 10 gigabit speed of the main server, even though every other port on there is in 10 gigabit, you can still take advantage of it. But then there are, of course, other switches out there that might have fewer numbers of ports, but they're all 10 gigabit. For example, I have another Netgear switch, which is simply four RJ45 ports and an SFP Plus port. However, every single one of these ports, all five of them are 10 gig. And this one is a lot more expensive than what you might see with other five port switches, obviously. This one was like $400 and it's not even managed, it's unmanaged. But the reason it's so expensive is because it's all 10 gig. So when it comes to port speed and price, usually these days, Everything is gonna be one gigabit. It's gonna be hard to find something that's only 100 megabit these days, but you might occasionally pay up more for a couple ports that are higher than one gig. They might be five gig or even 10 gig, and that's what you're paying for usually there. All right, now the third main reason you'll typically see for a higher price switch is so-called power over ethernet or PoE. This is a really cool technology that allows you to send not only data, but power over the ethernet cable. So this is really useful for devices where it might be really inconvenient to run a power cable. For example, a wireless access point that you're mounting on the wall. This way, if your ethernet port supports power over it, then it just goes right to the cable and then you only have to run one cable and it's low enough voltage where it's not gonna be dangerous or anything running through the wall. And you also might see this with IP cameras, so internet cameras that connect through ethernet and then that way again you don't have to run a separate power cable and it's much easier now there are different levels of poe power the most common one that's pretty high power is poe plus and that's about 30 watts of power per port and poe as a feature can affect the price of the switch in several different ways first of all if the switch supports it at all of course that's going to be a premium price and also how many ports on the switch of the total amount support PoE. So you might have, I don't know, a 48 port switch and then maybe only 10 of them support PoE. That's gonna be cheaper than one that supports all the ports having PoE. And then also the total maximum wattage that the switch can support across all of the ports. For example, with my switch, it is 48 ports and every single port on there can deliver the 30 watts of PoE individually. However, it has a 500 watt maximum. So assuming every device I plug into it uh, pulls the maximum wattage of 30 watts, which is not gonna happen, usually they don't pull the maximum, that means I could support up to 16 devices, all of them pulling the max, but of course, if they're doing fewer than the 30 watts, then it could support more than that, up to the 500 total. And also, if you remember that $1,000 switch I remembered from earlier in the video that looked the same as mine, the reason that one is $1,000 versus mine at like 800 is because that one supports 750 watts total of PoE power, whereas mine is only 500 watts. So for that extra couple hundred bucks, you get like 50% more power. Now for me, that's completely unnecessary because I'm not gonna plug in that many devices probably to support PoE. But if you are someone who is running a bunch of cameras and access points, that sort of thing, it might be necessary. So when you're in the main consumer to prosumer range of products, which I think most of you guys are gonna be in, I would say that those are the three biggest differentiators in price. So that's gonna be whether it's a managed or unmanaged switch, the speed of the ports, and power over ethernet support. Of course, those aren't the only reasons why one might be more expensive than the other. Of course, branding is gonna be part of it. And of course, when you get into higher enterprise grade switches, I mean, things can go really crazy and there's a lot more features that might go into enterprise switches. For example, you might have redundant power supplies. So even if one power supply on the switch fails, then the switch will stay up and running. This is for things like businesses where it's absolutely critical that the network stay up, obviously. You can have redundancy there. There's also features that are kind of tangentially related to the product, such as service contracts, warranties, 24 seven support. So the contract might say, oh, if something happens to the switch, then the company like Cisco or whatever will come out and service it for you, that sort of thing. And then of course, when it comes to like super high end stuff, just the reliability and general quality is gonna contribute to the price. I mean, when you're buying a super high end business switch, enterprise grade is gonna go in a data center or something, you might need this thing to have 100% uptime for a 
decade, right? You're not gonna ever get that with consumers. And also another thing to keep in mind is a lot of times if you're going with enterprise stuff, Usually you go to a company like Cisco that might have end-to-end -end solutions. So you're not just buying the switch from them, you're also buying the firewall, the servers, the router, that sort of thing. They might set it up for you for your specific business, you know, custom made configurations, all that sort of stuff is gonna be built into the price. And because it's all configured together and made by the same company, it all just works perfectly together. But of course, when you get into that super high end, like tens of thousands of dollars for a switch, I'm sure you can get, then that sort of thing is something that those features, even the most advanced home user is not even gonna think about or care about at all because you wouldn't even be able to use that sort of support. It's just not necessary. But hopefully now, at least for those of you in the actual regular market for like consumer, prosumer switches, now you can know why something might cost more than the other and you can actually differentiate the features and say, hmm, well, you know, this one actually does have the same exact features. It doesn't just look the same. I can tell what these features are. This one's way cheaper. Maybe go for that one and no, you didn't just get the cheapo one. So that's all I have to say here, but if you wanna keep watching, another video I'd recommend watching next is a video where I talked about consumer versus enterprise grade Wi-Fi. So that should be pretty interesting. I'll put the link right here, you can just click on. So I'm looking forward to hearing what you guys think down in the comments, and also I'll see you in the next video.